Lord, we bow our, our hearts before you today in, in reverence in, and in humble awe, knowing that we need you. Oh, we need you today, Lord. And whatever we do, whatever we accomplish in this life, it's not us, but it's Christ through us. And Lord, in this, this message for today, these handful of verses cut deep to our hearts. So Father, I pray for each one of us throughout this room today, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive receive your word, receive the truth of your word today as we continue to grow as your disciples for the honor and glory of God. It's in Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. Matthew 18, Jesus is continuing to teach, to train, to prepare his disciples. That's, that's what he's doing. This whole chapter, if you went through it and looked to see what is a word or a theme that is continually repeated in Matthew 18, it is, it is sin. It's sin and how to deal with sin. You say, Pastor, why is there a whole chapter in Matthew that's devoted to sin and how to deal with it? Because people sin. Amen? And, and let me get it even a little closer. We are going to sin against others, and others are going to sin against us. And so Jesus is working with his disciples and teaching them and saying, listen, you cannot, you cannot leave the fellowship of believers every time somebody does you wrong. Because family matters, it's time for the body of Christ to grow up. It's time for us to grow up. And it's hard, and I will tell you, um, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to teach on something different today, and I almost did, um, but I needed this, and so I share this message today not as somebody that's got it down, lock, stock, and barrel, but as somebody that I need to hear this to, and I continue to work through this. First thing that we see in this process of dealing with, with sin when someone has sinned against you is we see one-on-one. Is there anybody here that someone has done you wrong? Show of hands. Anybody here? Someone's done you wrong? Those that haven't raised their hand, they're sleeping because <laughs> it, it just it happens, right? Someone's done you wrong. Look at Matthew 18, beginning in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Actually, another translation says go and rebuke him. Uh, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Your your brother. It is uh, from the Greek word adelphos. Adelphos, it means a, means from. Delphos means womb. From the womb. From the same womb. But in the body of Christ, Jesus is drawing this and saying, listen, if, if, if one of your brothers... One of your siblings in Christ sins. Hamar, Hamar, Hamartia, Hamartino. Uh, it is missing the mark. Jonathan, our oldest son, shoots archery. Um, and, and he shoots at a target uh, in the shape of whatever animal it is. But the goal, the target he's shooting at is a, a circle about the size of a 50-cent piece. It's a tiny little target. And sometimes when he's there, if he doesn't get things dialed in right, when he's getting ready to shoot, he will miss the mark if your brother sins against you. What are you supposed to do? Well, you get on the telephone is what you do. You get on the telephone and you call everybody in the church and everybody in the community and you tell them what they have done. Don't bother going to them first. You tell everybody else first because that's the easiest way to get lots of people around you to support your position so then you can get them to do what you wanted them to do in the beginning. A lot of you are like, that is clearly not what it says, and yet that is clearly what happens way more often than we'd like to admit. 
You say, but why is that? Because isn't it easier to go and drum up support for your cause than it is to go and talk to the person? Isn't it easier to be able to get on the phone or get on the email? I can't believe what Pastor Glenn did. I can't believe what Susie did. I cannot believe what Jimmy did. I can't believe what this person did to me. Can, can you believe and all of a sudden what happens? It spreads. I think Matthew 18 is probably one of the most under understood and most underlived out passages of Scripture. And Jesus is saying, listen, listen, disciples, you're going to have times when your brothers, your sisters, your siblings in Christ, that they're going to sin against you. And when that happens, here's what you need to do. I know this is hard, but I'm calling you to grow up. I want you to go and tell him his faults between you and him alone. This is after you have spent time in the closet, the prayer closet, and have said, God, search my heart. God, look, look deep inside of me. Where am I wrong? What have I done that is wrong? Because if I've done something wrong, I want to get it taken care of before I go and talk to someone else. Many people say that, oh, we should never, you know, judge not that you be not judged. Judge. But if there's a wrong, if somebody's been wronged, we need to figure out how to have that time of communication, how to have that opportunity for conversation and discussion to get things right, to have them be reconciled. Can you imagine in marriage what our marriages would be like if we never worked it out? If every time our wife sinned against us or every time our husband sinned against us, went and told everybody else about it, the divorce rate would be astronomical off the charts. And I think, that, I think that this is an area, again, that the world watches how Christians handle conflict. They're like, they're supposed to be loving? They're supposed to be forgiving? I don't want to have anything to do with that. After you deal with the log in your own eye and after you realize where you are wrong and what you need to do, a lot of times we don't have to go and talk to anybody. But, but when the time comes, Jesus' words, and maybe and this is why this is at the beginning of the message, if you get nothing else out of this message, if someone sinned against you before you ever put fingers to the, to the keyboard, before you ever pick up the phone, before you ever say, well, do you know what happened? Can I just encourage you, go and talk to that individual between you and them alone. It's interesting, it says between the two of you, just you and him alone. If you ever want to ramp up a conflict and take it from a low-level conflict to right here, confront somebody about how they wronged you in front of lots of other people. I mean, and... We've all been there. We've either been there and been on the receiving end or admittedly we've been on the delivering end or we've been somewhere where somebody else has done it and it is, it is uncomfortable and it's like, this is not the way this should be. Something different should be done here. And he says, listen, go and talk to them, just the two of you alone. And what is the goal? Well, if he listens to you, you've gained You've gained your brother. A pastor friend of mine that I've um, built a friendship with, he lives down in um, southern Pennsylvania, um, he wrote the other day and said, um, not in reference to this message, just wrote a post about uh, dealing with wrongs. And he said this, and I'll, 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 here's his quote. He said, something in each of us strongly resists admitting we are wrong." That is why we admire people who openly and graciously admit their mistakes. These people have a strong self-image. They, they do not always have to be right to feel good about themselves. He said, when you are wrong, admit it. That's why James said in James 1, verse 19 and 20, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to, quick to hear and slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You go and you talk to this person, 
And it's not with the fanfare. It's not in front of everybody. It is going because your heart is broken that there is sin and the relationship has been severed. And if they listen, well, then you've gained your brother. That's the purpose of this, that you've gained your brother. And even though you'll notice in Matthew 18 and the, the next two examples that this phrase, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother, it's not there, it is implied. It is implied. That's the goal, that at some point they will listen and at some point the relationship will be restored. At some point there will be healing and restoration and the fellowship will be sweet and unity will be restored. This is a sibling in Christ. He said at the beginning, if your brother sins against you, and at the end he says, and if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Not, you just haven't gained any old person. You've gained your brother. Remember, we're not talking about you in the world. We're talking about you and a fellow sibling in Christ, bought with the precious blood of Jesus. The same grace that was poured out to you has been poured out to them. The same saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that's been given to you that you've received, they have also received. They just may have sinned against you, but they're still your brother. They're still... They're still your sister. And, and I have to admit that in my, my right out of the Marine Corps days, I struggled with this. I still struggle with it, but I see the benefit of talking to somebody and why you go and what you do. I don't want to conceal it. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. If you are on the end and someone is coming to you and saying, hey, Glenn, you did this, you said this, and you hurt me, you wronged me, can we get this worked out? When, when, when the person that has done the wronging confesses it and asks for forgiveness, there is mercy. That's why we are to forgive and allow that to be restored. And when we are on the other end where we've been wronged and we go and we confront somebody and they say, I was wrong, please forgive me. Don't you dare say, yeah, well, I don't, I, I'm not gonna forgive you. You can just see what it's like in my shoes for a minute. No, he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Why go one-on-one? -on -one? Why go in love? Why go in prayer? Why go with a heart of concern and, and love for the other person that you want them to be walking where they should because, because family matters. But if that doesn't work, and sometimes it doesn't work, and sometimes when it doesn't work, you have to go to the next step, and the next step is a multitude of counsel. The next step is a multitude of counsel. Look at verse 16. But if he does not listen, so, so he's He's not listening. You went, you talked, you, you prayed, you prepared your heart, you lovingly and graciously talked to the individual that you have this relationship with, and they just still don't listen. If they don't listen, he goes on and says, take one or two others along with you. The purpose of taking two or, or one or two others along with you is not so you can gang up on them. It's not so you can say, hey, it's going to be the three of us and we're going to take you. It's, that's not it. That's, that's not it. Again, I ask myself, well, why? Why is it wise to take one or two others with you? It may be that some of those others have had the same experience. And again, they are there to establish, to be able to establish a historical account, a record of fact. You know what, Glenn? Jimmy's not the only person you've done this to. You've done it to me, and you've done it to me, and we're here to be able to, we're going to intervene. We're going to talk to you about this. The whole thing is wrapped up in this, this next phrase, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. It might be that you need an extra set of eyes, an extra set of ears to be able to hear how am I bringing this up to this individual? How are they responding back to me? 
Again, again, what is the goal? What is the goal? The goal is the same as we saw back in verse 15. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. The goal is to be able to build and continue to, to have that, that unity. Not where you push problems off to the side, but where problems have been dealt with, sin has been confessed, wrongs have been righted, and they are able to go ahead and move ahead together in unity. And so you bring others in beside you. You bring some others, some godly men, some godly women who can be another set of eyes, who can be another set of ears. It is wise. It is so wise to have somebody else there because when angry words begin to be launched, it's nice to have other people to say, this is how Pastor Glenn talked and this is what the other person said. It's nice to have somebody else there to be able to say, Here's how it really went down. Or when I leave and I go back and I'm like, can you believe how they, they acted and reacted? Well, yeah. You poked your finger in their chest and said you were going to punch them in the nose. What? I did that? What are you talking about? See, those extra people are some accountability on you, but they're also some accountability on them. But the whole purpose for everybody involved is not to see how quickly you can, can cut cut. Uh, cut the line and cut them loose, it's to, it's to build that, it's to heal that, it's to win back the brother. And so there is wisdom, Proverbs 11, verse 14, where there is no guidance of people falls, but in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. In the abundance of those around you, and again, this is not the idea of I'm going to get on the phone and call everybody I can to get them on my side. It is a very humble, a very gracious, a very loving, a very merciful approach to saying, I got a situation with somebody and I need to talk. I've already gone and talked to them and I need to talk to somebody about this. Can you look at this through my eyes? And what am I missing? Will you go and will you talk with me? Why go one-on-one? Why take others with you? Don't miss this. Because family matters. Because family matters. God has given us the opportunity to be the body of Christ here at Chapmanville. And this family, you matter to me, and I hope we matter to you. But there are times when you go one-on-one and they won't listen, and then you go with one or two others and they, they still won't listen. And Jesus says, you know what, here's what you need to do. You need to understand and recognize the authority of the church. You go back in Scripture and look at the beginning of the Bible, you will see that the authority of the family, the authority of marriage was established by God. Later on, you see the authority of government established by God. Later on in the New Testament, you see the authority of the church is established by Jesus Christ. Does that mean that every marriage is perfect? No. Does that mean every parent is perfect? No. Does it mean every government is perfect? No. Does it mean that every church is perfect? No. Does it mean the decisions that we make are always perfect? No, doesn't mean that either. And it's on us as leaders when we make decisions to make decisions wisely, prayerfully, carefully, with much counsel, biblically making sure we're following the word of God. But sometimes, sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we get it wrong. I'm not talking about a sin issue. I'm talking about a decision issue. Should we cut down a tree? Should we not cut down a tree? Should we buy this or not buy this? Should we venture into this project or not venture into this project? Some, sometimes we get it wrong, but to the extent possible, we as a church, just so you understand, and as, as leaders, we go to Scripture, we take in counsel, we try to do what we feel God is leading us to do, and there are times when you have a conflict and it is it is a cancer in the body of the church, and it needs to be addressed, and sometimes you need to take it to the church itself. Look what he says in verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, just a, a pause here for a second. If you go back to verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens, you've gained your brother. Verse 16, but if he does not listen... If he doesn't listen, 
then go and take one or two more. And here he's saying, not if he doesn't listen, if he, if he refuses to listen. Now all of a sudden you have had godly men, you've had godly women who have come along beside you, not for the purpose of we're going to tell you, but hey, listen, this is what you're really doing. This is how it comes off. Do you not see that? Nope, I refuse to listen to you. And it still is an issue. He says if, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. Before we go further, what is the goal? The goal is the same. It's not to see how quickly we can get them to the church and kick them out. The goal is that, that forgiveness would be extended when an apology is, is rendered. When we recognize and admit our faults, what we've done is wrong and we have hurt the other individual. Man, I didn't even realize it, but now that you're saying this to me, I, I, I can see this. The goal, is, the goal is healing. The goal is to gain your brother. Reconciliation is the goal of Jesus' instruction. And the entire assembly of the body of Christ, the entire church should be wrapped up in saying, what can we do and how can we help this? Because our goal is restoration. As much as divorce hurts, divorce within the body of Christ, I don't mean two people that are married and get divorced. I mean, when somebody says, I don't love you anymore and I'm leaving. That hurts. It's not just a social member in a club. It's not that you decided to paint your house a different color. It's not that you're going to root for a different sport team. You're saying, I choose not to love you anymore, and rather than work this out, I am out of here. And I will tell you, it hurts and cuts to the quick. His goal is the same that there be reconciliation. Bring it to the church. This word that's here for church is um, uh, uh, ekle, ekklesia, 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 ekklesia. It is the assembly that is together. If you are a Sunday school class and you have somebody in your group that's a problem that has sinned against somebody else, that Sunday school class may be the assembly, the ecclesia that you bring this before. If you have a small group, that small group may be the ecclesia. If, if it's a bigger issue and it touches more people in the congregation, you may be bringing it before the board and bringing it before the church but whatever it is you do the purpose and the goal is the same it is that a confession would be made the wrong would be seen and understood they would confess it as wrong there would be forgiveness and reconciliation and you'd be able to move you'd be able to move ahead is it fun nope that's why it's dead quiet in here right now because this makes us all really uncomfortable in Matthew 16, Jesus told Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of heaven. And he uses phrasing that's similar that we see in Matthew 18, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. You say, well, what, what is that all about? It's that the church has been given the authority of God to handle issues within the church. That's, that's who we are. That's what God has called us to do. You say, well, that's a lot of power. There's a great deal of responsibility. And that's why the standard is held so high for those in leadership. It's not a matter of, well, you've been here long enough. Let's go ahead and put you on the board. No, no. You're, you're handling the keys of heaven in decisions that you make. And how you handle these things can have grave effects or great effects on others as well. And so he says, listen, you need to realize that if you bring him before the church, tell it to the church. And if he refuses, if he refuses to listen even to the church, it's not one person who's telling him, it's not one or two more that's telling him. You've got this group of believers, you've got the church as a whole saying, you do this all the time. 
You're hurting people with what you're saying and how you're doing it, and they still, they refuse to listen, even to the church. This is, this is hard. Then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. It's, it's not that the person loses their salvation. It's not that the church has the right to say, we now condemn you to eternal damnation and hell. That's not it. That, that's not it. It's saying if this person is not willing to be reconciled, they're not willing to admit their faults, they're not willing to be, to, to be in a place where they humble themselves under an, an, a fellow brother or sister in Christ against, uh, around a couple more who come and say, this is a problem, we want you to get it right. You're, you're abusing your children and it's wrong. You're abusing your wife, and it's wrong, and we're going to intervene. You have to get help, and they say, no, I refuse to. Then as far as the church is concerned, as far as the people involved are concerned, we remove you from the fellowship of this church. In the time of the Reformation, church discipline set the church apart as being a real thing and not just a social organization. You say, why? I mean, I've been a member here since, well, since we began. What are you talking about? Because sin hurts. Because sin in the body of Christ separates people. It separates us from each other. And to be treated like a Gentile is you're outside the kingdom of heaven. As to be treated like a tax collector, you're a traitor you're a traitor to the kingdom of heaven. You're not, you're not doing what is right for your people. You're not doing what is right for the body of Christ. They were viewed, both groups were viewed outside. And this whole idea of the keys in, in uh, Matthew 16, that Jesus said, I give you the keys. I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. As leaders, we are called to have keys to unlock the door and let people in who claim the name of Jesus. We're also called to unlock the door and escort them out when they are not. And it's not a matter of if you're a member at Chapmanville, you get into heaven. If you're not a member, you don't get into heaven. But there are times when we in church leadership have to make hard and difficult decisions for the betterment of the body of Christ. There's so many times that I've read about a shepherd that would have a lamb that was causing problems with the other sheep, and they would, <clears throat> they would either break the leg of the lamb, break the leg of the sheep to keep it from leading others away, and if it got so bad that it wasn't being fixed, they would kill it. Say, Pastor, are you talking about, no, 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 not saying that. But I'm saying the church that God has entrusted us with here at Chapmanville is precious in his sight. And sin is a problem. And, and, and you say, are you talking to me? I'm not talking to anybody at all in particular. And I'm talking to all of us in general. We need to realize the importance of the church and the example that we are for the world around us. And this is the reason why the instruction is to cut ties with the unrepentant sinner, to distance themselves and remove that sinful behavior from the body of the believers there so that it doesn't spread. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. This is often, taught. most people take this about talking about marriage. But look at verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, this is why a Christian boy should not date a non-Christian girl. That's true, but this goes way, before, way further than just dating relationships. You say, Pastor, none of us here is perfect, not even you. I, I realize that. But if we aren't willing to humble ourselves to each other and follow what God's word tells us to do and walk in a way that is, that is worthy of being called siblings in Christ, then something needs to change. 
He says, do not be unequally yoked for, with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? There, there's none. What accord has Christ with Belial or with Satan? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? He's drawing these stark contrasts to say, you are the family of God. You should be following the word of God and not following every woman passion that you have to the detriment of your fellow siblings in Christ. It shouldn't be like that. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among, among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Why, Why do we address sin one-on-one? -on -one? Why do we take the time to go with one or two others in love, in prayer, carefully, uh, 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 humbly, but still with the authority of Scripture to go and speak to somebody when there is a wrong? Why is it that if that doesn't work, that we are to take them before the church to be able to have it addressed? And if that doesn't work, to take the necessary steps that are painful to our heart and remove that individual from the fellowship because sin destroys relationships and because the family is a relationship and because the family matters. The family matters. Read this verse with me as we close. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Bow with me in prayer. Father, I, I, the passages like this, Lord, you know my heart. They leave me unsettled, not because, not because I don't agree with what your word says, but because when you are teaching us about something so often, it's because we're going to apply something. And so, Father, I pray for us as a fellowship of believers right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us of sin. And even, and even now, God, in this room, even now in this room, your Holy Spirit is bringing to mind and bringing to light sin in our hearts and lives where maybe we've sinned and wronged somebody else. I pray, Father, that we would humbly repent and honestly reconcile with that individual. I thank you, God, that your word tells us that if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, I pray if there is wrong between anyone here today that we, myself included, would get that right so that we can live together as a church in unity, that Satan would not have a foothold, that it would be a testimony to the world around us how sweet and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters in Christ dwell together in unity. And Lord, throughout this room right now, we pray against the work of Satan, the work of his demons to get a foothold, to get his foot in the door even a little bit, we pray, God, and ask that you would preserve us, that you would prepare us, that you would cleanse us, heart and soul, from all unrighteousness. We thank you, God, for these words today, knowing that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there in the midst of them. And God, if we... If we end up being on an island all by ourselves, we lose fellowship with each other and we're certainly not where you'd want us to be. So Father, today I pray you would do a work in my heart and life in this area. And in doing so, God, you'd receive the glory and the praise. It's in the name of Christ we pray all these things. Amen.